minutes to get settled. Oh, they've all gone quiet. Yes. So a guy silence. Outside. My phone is already silenced. There's a guy outside from the publisher. It's so Grande piacere vedervi qui uh, folti e numerosi. Uh, la conferenza di stasera è in inglese e quindi uh, d'ora in poi uh, sarà, sarà, presenteremo in quella, in quella lingua. So I am, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really special pleasure um, to, um, uh, to represent the Museo, the Museo Egizio in, uh, in uh, introducing David Wengro. Uh, he is probably best known to, to, to you and you sitting here and you who are uh, watching us online uh, for, his, uh, the, for the, best, the, the best selling book he wrote with uh, David Graeber. Uh, uh, entitled The Dawn of Ev Everything, A New History of Humanity, uh, translated in, uh, uh, in uh, 30 languages, uh, including uh, Italian, as you may have noticed, coming in. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it, it is a book that uh, ch challenges a narrative that is deeply embedded in our uh, collect collective view of history. Uh, you'll find it in e every textbook. It's a, it's a story, it's, it's uh, the story of how we were once uh, living in an Eden of sorts and working only three hours a day and uh, hunting rabbits or giraffes or whatever and gathering berries and spending the rest of the day, the day playing drums or playing with each other. And, and, uh, um, uh, and, that's, and then, uh, all, and then uh, we domesticate plants, or as, as some scholars like to put it, plants domesticated us. And that's where all, all our troubles began, and then social hierarchy sprang up, so the class society and the, fir the, fir the, the first early states uh, arose, and all the way down to um, uh, the, the civilization as we know it today. That that's is... Um, uh, this is a narrative we've all learned to give for granted, and this book uh, challenges it, challenges it through, through uh, bringing, bringing to bear a, a sweeping range of evidence that all the way from the, the, the Pacific coast of Northern America, uh, through Eurasia, uh, and Africa, all the way to, Aust to Australia. And uh, so it's not a book about Egypt. Uh, Egypt... Uh, uh, actually, I, I found the first pa page, pages uh, referring to Egypt, at, it's, uh, it starts at, at page 262. 
all of us, and there is an account in the Neolithic and the, in the Nile Valley, and I'm smiling, okay, the Egyptologist in me is all beaming, and I, and I start reading it about, uh, uh, about the Neolithic. Uh, two pages later, I'm on a canoe sailing from the Philippines carrying uh, tubers and, and, and chickens and pigs, uh, as well as a few stowaway rats, uh, and uh, to, uh, to, to Polynesia. So it's no wonder that uh, David Wengrow is a professor of comparative archaeology um, uh, at, um, uh, at uh, UCL, uh, Univers University uh, College London. Uh, it, it is, this book has a comparative perspective, but the book returns to Egypt late, later and more extensively, and um, uh, uh, David Wengro is, is also an Egyptologist, definitely an Egyptologist. He has, uh, uh, he has conducted archaeological fieldwork in, in Africa as well as the Middle, Middle East, and uh, among the, the, the many books and articles uh, he wrote, uh, one, the, the one, the one on the archae the, entitled The Archaeology of Early Egypt stands out. So um, uh, tonight, um, Egypt will be more to the fore, although he has uh, promised me that he will also take us beyond Egypt. And I'm uh, very um, excited and eager to hear what he has to, what he has to uh, tell us. Thank you so much. That was an incredible summary of our book. I, I wish I could do it that well. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. And thank you to the friends of the museum, to Dr. Greco uh, and all his colleagues. Um, it's, it's great to be able to uh, come back to my roots uh, a bit as an archaeologist, which, uh, as we heard, really did start with the, the prehistory uh, and the archaeology of uh, early Egypt. Uh, and Mesopotamia. Um, but I thought it might also be fun, uh, particularly in this venue, to go beyond Egypt. So actually the issues that I want to talk about are much more general. And they have to do with uh, a word that we already heard this evening, uh, the state, uh, which is a term widely applied to ancient as well as modern societies. And in a way that's the, uh, that's the problem and the issue that I want to address this evening. Because in our book, uh, The Dawn of Everything, uh, there is in fact a chapter called Why the State Has No Origin. Why the State Has No Origin. And in it, in that chapter, David Graeber and I suggested that a, a really original uh, approach to understanding relations of power and domination in deep history uh, which we don't pretend to have done ourselves, might not begin at all from the early centers of power, like ancient Egypt, uh, the so-called ancient or archaic states. But it might actually begin from their edges, from their margins, the times and the spaces in between. Now, academic uh, terminology, as uh, all the curators here will know very well, has often consigned these places and spaces to a sort of marginal status through the basic schemes of classification for time and space. I'm referring to the framing of centuries or even millennia of human experience as pre-proto-formative, post-terminal, intermediate, etc., which still shapes our presentation and our understanding of deep time and deep politics in most parts of the world. Now museums, arguably, uh, I tend to think have played a rather conservative role here. Museum goers across the world most likely will be faced, for example, with a division of ancient Egyptian displays into old, middle, and new kingdoms, separated by so-called intermediate periods, which span roughly a third of Egypt's ancient history. <laughs> 
down to the accession of a series of foreign or vassal kings, which is known simply as the late period. In fact, these intermediate periods saw some very interesting political developments of their own. To take just one example, and here we find out if it works, there it is. The third intermediate and late period, so we're talking about roughly the eighth to the sixth centuries BC, witnessed, among other things, the ascendance of women, foreign, unmarried, childless women, to superordinate roles in government through an office known as the God's Wife of Amun. But this political innovation, which historically is very unusual, at least to my knowledge, is rarely discussed in general treatments because it's already framed in chronological terms as a kind of transitory or even decadent period, the late period. Now, where do these chronological schemes actually come from? In the case of Egypt, one might assume that they have some basis in ancient sources, ancient written sources, but actually they don't. They are entirely modern inventions. In the late 19th century AD, uh, mainly Prussian Egyptologists introduced Reich or empire periods into ancient Egypt. And these were strongly modeled, often explicitly modeled, on the development of modern European states, cycling between periods of unification and supposed periods of social disintegration. And these schemes echoed the geopolitical concerns of Bismarck's Germany as much as any ancient reality. After the First World War, prominent Egyptologists like Adolf Ehrman granted the intermediate periods their own place in history. And Ehrman actually drew, in the key article, he actually draws an explicit comparison between the end of the Egyptian Old Kingdom and the Bolshevik Revolution of the early 20th century. Now, as I said in the book, we don't even try to unravel these schemes of classification. Our aims are actually much more modest, uh, which were really to try and arrive at a clearer definition of the forms of power or domination in opposition to which those intermediate or in-between times are defined. And we try to do this, uh, as you said, comparatively across multiple cases that have in the past been singled out as examples of early state formation. Having said that, there is no agreed definition among scholars as to what actually constitutes an early state. I could bore you with any number of definitions, but if you take the time and the trouble to dive into the literature, you'll find there's simply no elegant, widely received, or accepted definition at all, um, but rather a series of competing arguments and debates that we really don't need to go into. But the point is that this seemed like important groundwork because you know, just from a logical point of view, it's only once we're able to actually define those forms of power clearly that we can even begin to understand what a movement against them or away from them might actually represent. And I mean in something other than the purely negative language of interruption or chaos or anarchy or collapse. That is, this might begin to allow us to recognize actual positive acts of rejection or refusal or even perhaps of social revolution. And the main obstacle to a clear definition of these early forms of power we suggest in the book are precisely these kind of abstractions that come down to us from generations of theorizing about the evolution of human societies, theorizing that began long before there was any real archeological evidence to talk about. And one of the most important of these abstractions we also suggest is the state itself. <laughs> 
Now, modern nation states since the age of revolution have been based on the principle of popular sovereignty, the idea that the same power once held by kings is now held by an entity called the people. Of course, modern states are also much more than that. We might view them as a kind of combination or amalgam of three core institutional parts or elements, which, as we know, came together at a relatively recent point in modern history, roughly between the, the Treaty of Westphalia in the 17th century through to the 19th century. And these are elements which some people today argue are actually in the process of drifting apart again. And I'm referring not just to sovereignty, uh, but also to the principle of centralized administration or bureaucracy, and to a third element, uh, what we call democracy, um, in its particular form that we practice it, uh, mostly in the form of national elections, which by their very nature are political competitions. Completely different, uh, uh, I would add, from the, the ancient Greek or Athenian notion of democracy, which did not consider elections to be a democratic uh, way of appointing leaders, they preferred, um, and magistrates, they preferred random uh, sortition, drawing lots. Precisely because competitive elections, uh, as, as they perceived and as we know, have a tendency to throw up these sort of megalomaniacs who enjoy uh, power, um, not particularly democratic. Uh, I'll be talking a bit more about this next week at the Biennale uh, Democracy here in Turin. Now, uh, what I want to focus on this evening is something that's interested scholars for more than uh, a century, I guess, is precisely how and why these different elements of the state came together to produce this particular form of governance, which today is ubiquitous from one end of the world to another. I don't think there's any a priori reason to see this process as something that unfolds organically over thousands of years, extending back to ancient Egypt or the classic Maya or Shang China, although this is often uh, what's done. Uh, we know, and modern history uh, tells us, that the global spread, as it's sometimes called, of nation states was anything but evolutionary in character. And I'm assuming that nobody takes seriously any sort of... Um, Spencerian definition of evolution as the survival of the fittest or anything like that. We know that more often the uh, spread of nation states has, has generally taken the form of an imposition, uh, often by armed conquest, colonialism, empire, abetted by the enslavement, mass murder and dispossession of entire peoples. Now, if we consider more closely those three basic components of the modern state, sovereignty, bureaucracy, and political competition, we might see them as elaborations of actually much more basic forms of social domination. Uh, this is an idea that David and I um, uh, sort of play with in the book. Uh, we realize that actually if you think about it, uh, in essence, sovereignty is generally conceived um, is in essence about uh, exerting control over the legitimate use of force or violence, either over a territory or over a particular population. Administration, in essence, is about exerting control through the medium of knowledge or the circulation of information or misinformation and the distortion of information. And political competition, uh, as I discussed, uh, in essence, is about personal charisma. Now, if you think about it, uh, these are forms or ways of exerting influence or power over other people, which can work at any scale you like, all the way down to an interaction between you and I in a private situation, or a family, or a household. There's no particular reason uh, to see them as properties of the state. Um, but of course, we also know uh, that uh, just like domestic patriarchs, absolute kings and sovereigns throughout history uh, have taken the model of the household, the patriarchal household, uh, as the kind of uh, paradigm uh, for their own uh, uh, larger national or regional polities. And that would include, 
ancient Egypt. Okay. So we suggest that you know you can triangulate essentially between uh, these three basic forms of uh, of power, and that the modern state is defined by a combination of all three, which actually historically uh, is highly unusual. If we look uh, at the archaeological record, the deeper history uh, of what have been called ancient states, actually what we see much more typically uh, is that these three basic forms of power almost never come together in any kind of obvious or organic way uh, or in the kind of way that we tend to expect from governments today. Just as an initial illustration, one of my other main uh, research interests is the Middle East or what is sometimes called ancient Mesopotamia, uh, the modern countries of Iraq, Syria, parts of Turkey. Uh, research in those countries uh, over the last few decades is really giving us a completely different picture of what was once called state formation. Uh, actually, we don't see the earliest appearance of institutions like kingship uh, or monarchy in the cities. Cities arise in this region about 6,000 years ago in the fourth millennium BC, most famously at the site of Uruk, modern Warka in central Iraq. But actually, there's almost no really compelling evidence for the institution of kingship uh, until about 1,500 years later. Where do we then see the initial emergence of things like palaces and royal burials with human sacrifices and huge concentrations of metalwork and other forms of wealth? Well, it's actually not in the cities at all. The cities certainly have some kind of administration. Uh, there is certainly some kind of bureaucratic control over the flow of knowledge. We have the invention of the, the cuneiform script together with the Egyptian script, the earliest in the world. But these early, uh, sometimes centrally administered uh, cities show no evidence of the other forms of power. Actually, the earliest evidence for anything like aristocracy or monarchy uh, appears out on their spatial margins, up in the foothills of the Tauros and the Zagros Mountains in what today is southern Turkey. And I, I draw particular attention to the work of uh, Italian scholars at a site called Aslan Tepe, directed by uh, the great uh, Marcella Frangipane from La Sapienza University in Rome, uh, where they have found clear evidence of what they describe as a palazzo, a palace, dating to the middle uh, or later part of the fourth millennium BC, and also what they call a royal burial, among these really tiny, you know, demographically very small populations up in the foothills, way outside the cities, and centuries before anything like a palace or a royal tomb shows its face down in the, the great urban centers of the Tigris and the Euphrates. So we have this disconnection. Now, I guess one could argue that states, uh, the state first emerged in this region when the two forms of authority, the bureaucratic or administrative order of the cities and this kind of political, palatial, charismatic order of the highlands somehow came together in what historians call the early dynastic period. But even in much later times, there is very little to suggest that the rulers of Mesopotamian city-states achieved any significant measure of sovereignty or even made any such claims. So we're still a very long way from anything like an embryonic version of the modern state. Now, conversely, we can also point to historical examples of political systems where you have sovereignty in the absence of any kind of administrative apparatus or any formal arena of political competition. Anthropologists have long discussed cases like the so-called divine kingship of the Shiluk of South Sudan, or the Natchez, sometimes called Teoloel of Louisiana. These are two cases in point, where in each case, in relatively recent times, royal power was centered on capitals, 
central places, respectively, the Reth or King's compound at a place called Fashoda, uh, these days called Kodok in the Western Nile province of South Sudan, and the so-called Great Village of the Natchez King, these days known as the Fatherland Site in a place called Adams County. And these places contain shrines. We have music. They contain shrines with music and where rulers would follow a very elaborate schedule of daily rituals, where there were complex ceremonies. These were royal households, uh, which also comprised a sort of eclectic mixture of royal wives, who were often very powerful, and other kin and servants and dependents and retainers. Now, within their rather small kingdoms, the Shiluk Reth, and the Natchez king, or great son, as he was known, wielded absolute power of command. They could do pretty much anything they liked. They could order summary executions. They could appropriate goods pretty much as they had a mind to. But in both cases, a variety of documentary sources confirm that these sovereigns lacked any effective way of extending or stabilizing their power beyond the immediate perimeter of the royal court or even beyond their physical persons. And these, these arrangements are kind of funny because actually what, what archaeology shows is that a lot of other people uh, spent most of their time running away from the court or doing everything possible to distance themselves from these centers of power. Um, and led much more free lives elsewhere. This also seems to be the case with Marcella's site of uh, Aslan Tepe, where the establishment of the palace in the late fourth millennium BC is actually associated with a contraction, uh, a shrinkage of the overall uh, scale of the site. Uh, so people see some big honcho setting up a shop, and the first thing they do is run away, and there's very little to stop them running away. So. The basic argument is that when we look at these times and places in human history, which are usually taken to mark the origins of the state, the question we're asking is, could we in fact be seeing something else? Could we in fact be seeing how very different kinds of power crystallized, in each case with a particular partial combination or juxtaposition of violence, knowledge, and charisma? It's a model that we're trying out, basically. And I think one way to test the, uh, the value or the validity of a new model is to see if it actually helps to explain cases which seemed difficult or anomalous under the pre-existing model. And in, that, in this instance, uh, that means we're talking about ancient polities which mobilized and organized enormous numbers of people at the behest of leaders or elites but that somehow just don't seem to fit any of the usual definitions of a state, or perhaps that are clearly organized around certain principles that we associate with states, but are just as clearly lacking in others. Now, there are many such examples in the archaeological record, and the uh, inability, the difficulty that researchers have accounting for them is really striking, uh, and frankly, a bit of an embarrassment. In fact, there are so many anomalies in this regard that one begins to wonder if the whole thing is really just an artifact of our own conceptual limitations. Let's take, and here I'm going to go wildly beyond Egypt. Sorry. Um, Let's take, for example, the Olmec civilization. Civilization uh, variously referred to by 20th century scholars as an artistic or cultural horizon straddling the isthmus of Tehuantepec, including parts of Guatemala, Honduras, and much of southern Mexico, often considered to be the mother culture of all later Mesoamerican civilizations, having invented the region's characteristic calendar systems, glyphic writing, and ceremonial ball games. Now, archaeologists have come to recognize that there is an Olmec heartland, an Olmec center of sorts, and it's in the marshlands of Veracruz, where you have these swamp cities sort of rising out of the mud, places like San Lorenzo and La Venta, 
uh, along the fringes of Mexico's Gulf Coast. But the internal structure of these Olmec cities is still very poorly understood. Most of them seem to be centered on ceremonial precincts. We have large earthen pyramid mounds, we have pyramids, surrounded by extensive suburbs. And as currently reconstructed by archeologists, these monumental centers stand in relative isolation among a very, uh, you know, surrounded by this very fragmented landscape of small maize farming settlements and seasonal hunter-gatherer camps. I suspect all this is gonna change. Those of you familiar with the impact of uh, LIDAR technology is this amazing uh, aerial sensing technology where you can peer down from the sky through the forest canopy and actually perceive architectural traces in the land. It's a completely non-invasive form of archaeology, but it's revolutionizing the archaeology of areas under tree cover, uh, also in places like Yucatan. So I expect there will shortly be much more evidence of human settlement, if not already. In the meantime, archaeologists like Warren Hill, John Clark, Jeffrey Blomster, and others have reconstructed an intriguing relationship between competitive games, ball games, drawing participants and spectators from a wide hinterland, and the rise of this Olmec aristocracy. And this is not least owing to these uh, famous, extraordinary, colossal uh, carvings, these monumental heads which are carved out of basalt, it's incredibly laborious. You imagine to produce, uh, you know, some of you may have seen these enormous things. And intriguingly, these heads uh, appear to be uh, actual portraits uh, of uh, individuals, men, wearing the leather helmets of ball players. Uh, they're not actually that dissimilar from uh, modern American football. <laughs> Uh, uh, hats, helmets, uh, and they're each emblazoned with these individualizing kind of insignia. And all the known examples are sufficiently similar that we can say there is some kind of shared ideal of beauty, masculine beauty perhaps, but they're all equally different to be seen as unique portraits of particular champions. So we have this intense fusion of political competition and organized spectacle uh, and it's easy to appreciate why the Olmec are often seen as the cultural progenitors of all these later Mesoamerican kingdoms and empires that had similar practices. But actually there's very little evidence that Olmec polities themselves ever created an infrastructure for dominating a large population. As far as we know, there was no stable military or administrative apparatus which might have allowed these rulers to extend their power over a large hinterland. Instead, what we see is this remarkable spread of cultural influence radiating outwards from these ceremonial centers, which themselves may only have been densely occupied on particular occasions, ceremonial seasonal occasions. If we turn to South America, this is exactly the kind of map I, I, I don't like uh, because it, it misrepresents uh, the past. So we're looking here at ancient polities which predate modern nation states by thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. But as you can see, they're all beautifully represented exactly as if they were sort of uh, post-Westphalian nation states, polygons with very clear national boundaries. Of course, this is all nonsense. Uh, but, you know, it's an interesting challenge for museums and heritage sites, I think, to think about how does one otherwise represent centers and peripheries. Clearly not like this. Uh, but anyway, um, there it is. It gives you an idea. Uh, it's just supposed to give you an idea of what there was before the famous Inca Empire, which was a whole series of these other polities uh, in and around the Peruvian Andes and the adjacent coastal drainages, which in the literature are tentatively called early states. Now, scholars like Jeffrey Quilter and Michel Kunz have discussed how the first Europeans to study the remains of these early Peruvian polities, things like the Moche polity uh, or uh, Huari or Tiwanaku, simply tended to assume, to assume that any city 
or group of cities with monumental art and architecture exerting some kind of influence over a large hinterland must be capitals of states or empires. And it's an assumption that persisted well into the 20th century. But actually, as with the Olmec case, a surprisingly large amount of that influence comes in the form of images. Images distributed on little ceramic vessels, on objects of personal adornment, on textiles, rather than in the spread of administrative, military, or commercial institutions, the technologies of a, a Westphalian nation state. Let's consider very briefly Chavin de Juantar. Uh, this is, I think I've lost the slide. It's, oh no, there it is, Chavin de Juantar. Um, this is a center located high up in the Mosna Valley of the Peruvian Andes. Now, archaeologists once believed Chavin to have been the core of a pre-Inca empire, a state controlling a hinterland that reached all the way from the Amazonian rainforest to the east and the Pacific coast in the west, encompassing most of the highlands and coastal drainages in between. This level of power seemed commensurate with the scale and the sophistication of Chavin's cut stone architecture, its abundance of monumental sculpture, and the appearance of Chavin artistic motifs on pottery, jewelry, and fabrics across this wider region. But in fact, as Quilter and Cohns and others have pointed out, there is really no evidence to suggest that Chavin was some kind of Rome of the Andes. Actually, to better understand the kind of polity that Chavin really was, they argue, requires us to look much more closely at its imagery. Unlike that of the Olmec, Chavin art does not readily lend itself to reconstructing narratives, pictorial narratives. Chavin images are different and complex in other ways. We have these designs of crested eagles that sort of curl in on themselves and they vanish into a kind of maze of ornament. You have these human faces that grow fangs or contort into grimaces and it takes a long time actually for the eye to become attuned to the images so that they actually stand out from this tangle tangle of, uh, of images. And you can sort of train yourself to tease out and become sensitive to recurrent uh, features, tropical forest animals like jaguars, snakes, and caiman. But just as you sort of focus in on them, they slip away from the field of vision, sort of winding in and out of each other's bodies or merging into complex patterns. Now, these are sometimes described in the literature as monsters, but they're nothing like the sort of chimeras that you get on moche pottery, or for that matter, on ancient uh, Greek pottery or in Mesopotamian sculpture. They're not those kind of composite figures. We're in a completely different sort of visual universe here. It's really the realm of the shapeshifter, where no body is ever stable, and you have to do this kind of diligent mental training to even tease out what's going on. And there's actually a lot of circumstantial evidence from Chavin, including things like snuff spoons and images of, uh, of hallucinogenic plants, vilca leaves, the so-called San Pedro cactus, it's very powerful, uh, and also human-like figures. You can see one there with mucus that actually gushes down from their noses. Now, this is all about how the experience of art was related to psychoactive visions and altered states of consciousness. Actually, there is very little in Chavin's monumental landscape that seems to have anything to do with secular government. There are no obvious military fortifications or administrative quarters. Almost everything that survives, on the other hand, seems connected with ritual and with the revelation or the concealment of esoteric knowledge, including the famous old temple with its stone labyrinths and hanging staircases, which seem to be designed for individual trials or initiations, perhaps vision quests, these kind of tortuous journeys that end in narrow corridors, only large enough for one person to go through. And beyond that, in the middle of it all, is this tiny sanctum, which contains a monolith 
El Lanzón, a monolith carved with this dense tangle, sort of web of images. So it's in the middle of this dark maze, illuminated by these little slats. So you can see that no viewer could ever have perceived the whole thing at once. Now, I'd suggest that if Chavin was in any sense an empire, it was an empire built on control over images linked to esoteric knowledge. And clearly, this is also true, uh, in some sense, of Olmec rulership. But the latter, the Olmec, does present a very distinct emphasis as well on spectacle, competition, and the personal attributes of political leaders, which has no obvious equivalent that I'm aware of in the Chavin case. Now, clearly, any use of the term empire here is about as loose and imprecise as it could possibly be. Neither of these cases, as far as we can tell, was remotely similar, say, to the Roman or the Han empires, or indeed to the later Inca and Aztec. Nor do they fulfill any of the important criteria for statehood, at least not on most standard sociological definitions like the monopoly of violence or levels of administrative hierarchy. So the usual practice in archaeology has been to describe regimes like this as complex chiefdoms or you know, use other kinds of jargon that, that just seem sort of hopelessly inadequate. And so we thought instead, why don't we try to look at these rather puzzling cases through the lens of our three elementary forms of domination? control over violence, control over knowledge, and charismatic politics. How each, perhaps, stresses a particular form of domination to an exceptional degree and develops it on, on an unusually large scale. We could refer to these as, perhaps, uh, first-order regimes because they seem to be organized around just one of the three elementary forms of domestication, knowledge control for the Chavin and charismatic politics for the Olmec, to the relative neglect, not the exclusion, but the relative neglect of the other two. And then to fully illustrate the model of first order regimes, obviously one would also have to ask if you can have the other possibility uh, where you have control over violence or a principle of sovereignty without uh, an apparatus for controlling knowledge or a competitive political field. And as we've seen, you can. We've already discussed two examples, the Shilluk of South Sudan and the Natchez of Southern Louisiana, which is widely regarded as the only undisputed case of divine kingship north of the Rio Grande. The rulers of those polities enjoyed an absolute power that would have satisfied an Egyptian pharaoh or a Sapa Inca, but they had little capacity, as we've discussed, to extend that power beyond their immediate physical ambit. And to my knowledge, it's never occurred to anyone to refer to those cases as a state. Now, I want to turn um, embarrassingly briefly to a number of other cases, the ones which are usually canonically almost considered to be straightforward examples of archaic states or empires. I'm talking about Old Kingdom Egypt, early dynastic Mesopotamia, Shang China, Inca Peru, and the classic Maya. We could begin by noting some very significant parallels between Egypt and Peru, which I think is one of the best arguments against any sort of environmental uh, determinism, because you can't possibly imagine two landscapes that are more different than the sort of vertical archipelagos of Peru uh, and the, the Nile Valley. Um, but here we have two cases where the principle of sovereignty became armed with a bureaucracy and did manage to extend itself across a large territory in a more or less uniform manner. And there are other similarities as well which go down to really uncanny details, like the mummification of dead rulers and the way that such mummified rulers continue to maintain their own rural estates, and also how living kings were sometimes treated as almost godlike uh, creatures who had to make periodic tours of their domains. Both societies also seem to share a certain antipathy 
to cities and urban life. Their capitals, their official capitals, were essentially ceremonial centers, stages for royal display with relatively few permanent residents. And their ruling elites in their art and so on preferred to depict and imagine their subjects as living in a realm of bucolic estates and hunting grounds. But other so-called early states followed completely different paths. Early dynastic Mesopotamia was made up of some dozens of city-states of varying sizes, each governed by its own charismatic warrior king, all vying and competing for dominance. It's only very occasionally in the history of this period that one ruler gains enough of an upper hand to create anything that might be described as the beginnings of a unified kingdom uh, or even an empire. The cities they ostensibly ruled over had already been around for centuries. They were commercial hubs with strong traditions of self-governance, each with its own city gods who presided over local systems of administration in temples. Kings, in this case, almost never claim to be gods, but rather the god's servant or supporter, or vicegerent, or sometimes heroic defender on earth. In short, a kind of delegate of sovereign power that properly resides in heaven. And those of you familiar with the Sumerian king list and the story of the origins of kingship, kingship comes down from heaven. It already exists up there not down here. And the result was a kind of dynamic tension between these two principles, as, as we noted earlier, which originally began in opposition to each other. The administrative order of the river valleys on the one hand, and this kind of heroic, charismatic politics of the surrounding highlands. Sovereignty in the last resort was for the gods. The classic Maya Classic Maya lowlands were different. Again, to be a ruler, or a chao, was to be a kind of hunter and a god impersonator of the first rank, a warrior whose body on entering battle or during dance rituals became host and received the spirit of an ancestral hero or a deity or these dreamlike monsters. Royal households internally were definitely structured according to quite elaborate ranks and offices. But there's actually very little to suggest that Maya sovereigns possessed an extensive bureaucratic apparatus to manage the subject's affairs. Achals, or to be an achal or a ruler, seems to have been uh, to be like a sort of miniature god. And if anything is projected out into the cosmos, in the classic Maya case, it is precisely the principle of bureaucracy, a sort of cosmic bureaucracy. So with the emergence of hereditary rulership, the Maya cosmos itself comes to be imagined as a kind of administrative hierarchy governed by predictable laws, a kind of intricate set of celestial or sometimes subterranean wheels within wheels so that you can actually establish the exact birthdays and death dates of the divinities, the major gods, thousands of years back into the past. So for example, there is a deity called Muan Mat, who we know was born on the 7th of December, 3,121 BC, seven years before the creation of the universe. Even though it might never occur to the same people who are doing that to actually register things like the number of their citizens or the amount of wealth or the birth dates of their own subjects. Now, if we start looking at Shang China, things uh, will only get more complicated. Uh, like uh, the Inca capital of Cusco, the Shang capital at Anyang was designed as a kind of pivot of the four quarters, sort of cosmological anchor for the entire kingdom laid out as this grand stage of royal ritual. And like both Cusco and the Egyptian capital at Memphis, the city served as home to the royal cemeteries and their attached mortuary temples, as well as a living administration. Anyang's industrial quarters produced vast quantities of bronze vessels, 
jades used to commune with ancestors. But in most important ways, we find very little similarity between the Shang and either Old Kingdom Egypt or Inca Peru. Shang rulers did not claim sovereignty over an extended area. They couldn't even travel safely, let alone issue commands outside a narrow band of territories clustered on the middle and lower reaches of the Yellow River, close to the royal court. Even there, one is left with a sense that Shang rulers didn't claim sovereignty in the same sense as an Egyptian, Peruvian, or even Maya ruler. The clearest evidence for this is the exceptional importance of divination in early Chinese polity. And we know that divination becomes important in Egypt as well, particularly in the New Kingdom. But I think in the Old Kingdom, um, it doesn't appear to have anything like that status. So in this case, in China, any royal decision, whether we're talking about war or alliances or founding new cities or even very trivial things like extending the royal hunting grounds, could only proceed if it was first approved by the ultimate authorities, who were the gods and the ancestral spirits. Shell and bone oracles were stored for consultation. Now, it is possible that writing was also used for much more mundane, everyday purposes, perhaps on perishable media that don't survive. But there's no clear evidence at this time for other forms of administrative archives of the kind that become so characteristic of later Chinese polities, nor anything much in the way of an administrative apparatus. Like the classic Maya, Shang rulers routinely waged war to acquire stocks of living human victims for sacrifices. Rival courts to the Shang had their own ancestors and sacrifices and diviners, and while they appear to have recognized the Shang as paramount, there seems to be no contradiction between that and actually competing with them in war or other tournaments. So, in terms of the specific theory that we've been trying to develop here, where the three elementary forms of domination, control over violence, control over knowledge, and charismatic authority, can each crystallize into its own institutional form, I think all of these cases might be described as second order regimes of domination. So we have first-order regimes like the Olmec, the Chavin, or the Natchez, which develop just one part of the triad. And then we have the typically much more violent arrangements of these second-order regimes where two of the three principles of domination are brought together in some spectacular and unprecedented way. And which two it might have been clearly varies from case to case. Egypt's first rulers combined literate administration with sovereignty, and there's no clear illustration of that. Uh, those colleagues here who've worked at the, uh, the mortuary uh, areas of Abydos in southern Egypt, where you have these extraordinary uh, burials of uh, human uh, retainers of the court, sometimes numbering in the hundreds or even in the thousands, dating to the first and the early part of the second dynasty, who a lot of circumstantial and occasionally direct evidence suggests were ritually killed in order to be buried around the central tombs of the earliest Egyptian rulers. So there's no clearer illustration of personal sovereignty, I think, than that. On the other hand, we have these Mesopotamian kings who navigate between administrative order and a kind of competitive heroic politics. And then we have the classic Maya Achaos, who seem to somehow fuse heroic politics with sovereignty. Now, it's not as if any of these principles of domination was completely absent in any one case. Actually, what often seems to happen is that two of them crystallize into uh, actual forms of government. And the third one is largely pushed out of the realm of human affairs altogether and kind of displaced onto the non-human cosmos as with divine sovereignty in China or Mesopotamia, or the cosmic bureaucracy of the classic Maya. 
Equally, and I want to stress this, when we speak of an absence of charismatic politics in Old Kingdom Egypt or Inca Peru, we're talking about the lack of a kind of star system or a hall of fame where you have institutional rivalries between warlords or local magnates. We are most definitely not speaking about an absence of individual personalities. And actually, I think one could argue, which we, we sort of do in the book, that the transition from the so-called Old Kingdom to the so-called First Intermediate Period in Egypt might be usefully characterized as a kind of shift from patrimonial sovereignty to local charismatic politics as widely accepted forms of governance. So I want to sort of draw things to a conclusion with a question, um, which is, uh, what does it mean today to describe all these varying forms of power as common manifestations of just one institutional form, the early state, the archaic state? I would suggest this has a range of effects which actually add very little to our comprehension of the past and may, in fact, even disguise some important aspects of power relations in the past and maybe even in the present. One such effect is to leave largely unspecified the forms of power concerned, which in turn renders their disappearance or collapse or reconfiguration largely incomprehensible in social or historical terms. As their chronological labels suggest, those periods in which people of the past moved away from or against specific forms of organized power are instead recast as temporary interruptions or lag times in some kind of meta-historical process of state power consolidating itself. This is what we're supposed to think. Now, I think no doubt part of the reason for this thinking and why it persists is that early states are still often thought of as bringing into being completely new forms of social power, as if power appeared from a kind of vacuum. But actually what David uh, Graeber and I try to show in our book, The Dawn of Everything, is that this idea too has very little basis in archaeological evidence, which really as far back as it takes us in these kind of questions presents exactly the opposite impression of societies before the state. We get a picture of Neolithic or even non-agricultural societies, hunter-gatherer societies that were no strangers to our three forms of power, or even to the idea of revolution, if we define that broadly. Uh, I think it was Tolstoy who said a revolution is basically a change that occurs in a people's relation to power. In the book, we look at evidence for hunter-gatherers who alternated their political systems between hierarchical, even kingly, and egalitarian forms on a routine basis, achieving structural changes, transformations, sometimes within the scope of a single calendar year. Changes that conventional theory tells us ought to belong to the kind of long durée of social evolution. Often these kind of structural reversals took place seasonally, coinciding with periods of annual abundance or scarcity. Sometimes it happens by confining certain forms of power and property relations to very particular contexts, ritual or ceremonial. So we have kind of play kings or theatrical kings long before we have kingship. We discuss cases of societies that refused specific forms of power by moving away from them. Societies that elected back in prehistory to do the opposite of their neighbors, following alternative political paths with cumulative effects that gave rise to these extensive zones of cultural uniformity and differentiation that archeologists don't know how to describe, what used to be called culture areas, sometimes interaction spheres or networks, uh, etc. Now, the basic point that we venture is that all of this and more was happening in different ways across all the world's continents many thousands of years before the appearance of anything even vaguely resembling the state and indeed long before the coming of agriculture. Now, of course, all of this is a very long way from 20th century narratives of global history 
structured, as we heard, around the two great revolutions, the Neolithic Revolution and the Urban Revolution, as the great thresholds of human political development, straddling those thousands of years before the Age of Enlightenment and the great political revolutions of the last few centuries. In the book, and I can only touch on this extremely briefly, we also note how contemporary archaeology reveals our three elementary forms of social power, sovereignty, competitive politics, and specialized administration to first appear in isolation from each other among demographically small groups long before their incorporation into centralized forms of governance. I've lost track these days of how many small-scale kingdoms we're supposed to have in Egypt before the first dynasty. We have dynasty zero, dynasty zero, zero, and back to strange uh, uh, cemeteries like this prehistoric, pre-dynastic cemetery dating to the middle of the fourth millennium BC, so we're about uh, uh, 500 years earlier than the first named royal dynasty, but we already have these vast tombs uh, not just of human beings, but this place has actually been described as the world's first zoo uh, because there are these burials of all kinds of exotic animals, like little elephants and monkeys and rhinos and God knows what. It's clearly some kind of vast cosmological statement, but who knows what. Um, but there's no evidence in this case of anything like uh, an extensive administration or standing armies or any of the other signs of state formation. Those of you who are interested in prehistoric Europe will know that we have evidence for warrior aristocracies long before we have evidence for anything like administration or kingship. And then we have the curious case of these village-scale bureaucracies which appear in Mesopotamia thousands of years before the emergence of city life. Nobody knows why they do this. These are Village settlements like this one, excavated by uh, Dutch and Syrian archaeologists before the Civil War uh, at a site called Tel Sabi Abyad in the Balikh Valley, where you have a tiny village of maybe two or three hundred people, where they actually invent these highly specialized forms of administration, using clay, seals, and ceilings, and even keeping archives. Uh, like little village bureaus or records of transactions in these tiny communities. Nobody knows why, but it certainly doesn't fit the picture of bureaucracy as part of state formation. Now, we could also note that these same kinds of institutions seem to be either lacking or at least highly attenuated in a surprising number of the world's first known cities. For example, Again, very, very briefly, I can only touch on this. We have these amazing so-called mega sites now in Ukraine, north of the Black Sea, uh, between the southern Bug and the uh, Dnieper rivers. These huge settlements, thousands of people forming concentric uh, patterns of houses with no temples, no palaces, no royal burials, no central administration, very few signs of inequality at all. And then we have other cases like the much discussed Bronze Age cities of the Indus Valley or the later phases of urban life at Teotihuacan in the Valley of Mexico that we go into in the book. The basic point I want to make is um, that it wouldn't be exaggerating, I think, to say that really uh, at this point in time, an entirely new picture is emerging of what was once called state formation. And if I might venture one final generalization, uh, it seems likely in view of all this that actually the most important and revolutionary studies of the roots of social power and domination in future will in fact begin not at the level of grand evolutionary abstractions, but actually at the small scale, the level of gender relations, age groups, and domestic servitude the kind of relationships that contain at once the greatest intimacy, but also the deepest forms of structural violence. And in pursuing those kind of studies, we suggest it will be important to distinguish these elementary forms of social power, how they've come together and drifted apart, looking at the affinities and the tensions between them in different cases, and also the many ways in which people at particular times, 
and particular places throughout human history have in fact succeeded in containing those forms of power and even being free of them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, you did take us way beyond ancient Egypt, but the ride was well worth it. And, um, and now it's, uh, in, it's to you, the audience. Are there any questions you'd like to ask in uh, any of the two languages? That, uh, yeah, please. Uh, provo, provo in inglese, se non c'è. Um, thank you very much, Professor, for your lesson. Uh, I first of all would like to um, apologize for my horrible English. But <laughs> I... No, no, I apologize <laughs> for my non-existent Italian. <laughs> no, no, no need for that. No, no, I swear, I promise I will do my best. Uh, and I also hope not to be too much off topic with this. But um, uh, your much of your recent work has dealt with uh, concepts like uh, rethinking, like just today, or uh, the dawn of everything uh, itself. Uh, so my question for you is this. Um, would you agree with me if I said that in a, a broader sense, uh, learning from the past, so uh, thanks to the disciplines of humanities, such as um, archaeology or history, uh, might be tools for imagination and creativity, uh, not only to stay inside the present, but also to imagine the, the future times, um, to, to make it clearer and even simpler. Mm, we could say that mm, we study mm, and we know what worked and what didn't. I, I say we because I'm an archaeologist uh, myself and what didn't work. So uh, knowing that it, it could be uh, an occasion to decide altogether the future times to come in a politi political perspective, and I mean political in, in the Greek sense, like so the, the, the art of the policy itself. And to make it, uh, again, even clearer and simpler, um, I utterly believe that all I all have uh, referred to now uh, might be a, a sort of a tool among the, 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 the many to crush the, the famous there's no alternative, um, which is based upon the common sentence like things have always gone this way. So if we, if we know our art, we might do our part in the, in the society from that point of view. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. I can agree with almost everything you said and you said it very eloquently. But there's just one part of it that I would not personally agree with, which is the idea that one could or should look to the past uh, as an, uh, a, a kind of trial run for the present, or you know, w with the aim of saying this could work or this couldn't work. I suspect this is the wrong way to go, uh, simply because, you know, it's not how history works. I mean, the, the, you know, the, so, many, so many different factors. I think the, everything else you said I can completely embrace, um, which is really essentially the point of, of the book I wrote with David, is to show that precisely those points of human history that we're always told were kind of points of no return with X, Y, Z consequences actually weren't the invention of agriculture, the appearance of cities, the origins of the state, these things are supposed to set our species on a particular kind of pathway. But actually what we see empirically is a whole series of other pathways crossing over, some of them are followed, some of them are not followed. So for me, it's more a question of looking at the way that our grand narratives of the past actually constrain our thinking about the present and the future in the sense that an urban planner might say, no, this is impossible. You cannot have a participatory, democratically organized system on this. Well, why not? 
What's the evidence? Oh, well, it goes back to the origin of cities. Well, actually, no, it doesn't. So it's much more a case of actually querying, quite forensically, case by case, uh, these so-called points of no return, and actually showing that in the past, human beings have been much more fluid and much more inventive around those kind of transitions, in which case uh, it becomes much more reasonable to ask why we too can't be more fluid. That makes sense. But I wouldn't look to the past for direct kind of uh, you know, yes, no answers or exact models that one might imitate. Personally. Ah, se, se avete domande anche in italiano, io provo a tradurre volentieri. Se no, tanto chiedo io una. I, I'll ask. Uh, is there a question over? Uh, no, no, go ahead. Bye, Max. Max. Good evening, Professor Vengro, and thank you very much for your amazing lecture. Um, I would say I totally agree with you, except probably one point that you seem to stress at the beginning. As far as I understood, you try to deconstruct the so-called determinism of the environmental features of this society, which is true, of course. I cannot say Egypt is the land of the Nile st full stop, because it's very simplistic. But in a way, of course, many of the differences that uh, you know, characterize Egypt, um, Mesopotamia, China, and whatever, are indeed based on the environment. So I, if I fully understood your, your, you know, your talk, it seems that you want to really deconstruct this environmental uh, feature. You just consider sovereignty, uh, really, actually, administration, etc., uh, etc. Et if you look at uh, the actual cases that we present in the book, we, we actually go into quite a lot of detail on the environmental context. I think the key term that you used is based on the environment. What do you mean by that? Well, for example, I can make just one example, of course, it's a very long discussion, but the feature of Egypt with the Nile that really unites all the country. From sometimes. The Delta, sometimes, yes, okay, but in general, from the Delta to Aswan, at least, it's not the same that you have in Mesopotamia, because the mm -hmm. regime of the Tigris and the Euphrates is completely different. Of course. So this, is, this has an effect in the end, in the yeah, history. I, I don't personally see any tension between accepting the obvious physical realities of the landscape and actually looking historically at what institutions have developed within them. I think the, uh, what is not convincing to me is the idea that the environment determines those forms in any simple or direct way. Okay, I think we have to, de to discuss it more <laughs> in another lecture. Thank you very much, anyway. Okay. I mean, otherwise you'd have to explain, for example, the, the striking similarities between uh, Inca or Peruvian kingship and Egyptian kingship in two completely different environments. How would you explain that? Of course, I don't say that nah, Egypt is only the result of the environment, but mm -hmm. I think that many differences can be explained through the environmental features. Not all, of course, yeah. not everything. Cer certain things, for sure, yeah. And we do. <laughs> Thank you for uh, your lesson. Uh, I, will t I would like to ask about uh, the accumulation of wealth. Mm. In your model, uh, it, in which way the accumulation of wealth can be, uh, in, could be interacted with all the parts of the model? Is only a side effect or can be a cause? Mm. What can be? Well, the, there's a, a real fashion at the moment in uh, archaeology for measuring stuff, like trying to find objective measures of wealth. So there's a huge number of studies going on in all different parts of the world. A lot of them are very interesting, which basically apply the tools of modern economics, uh, even down to kind of uh, uh, Gini or Gini coefficients, you know, to try and estimate uh, wealth differentials. Uh, in societies going all the way back to prehistoric hunter-gatherers. I think some of those studies are very interesting, but what, what they often do, or rather don't do, is ask why wealth actually matters, or whether wealth actually matters, in the ways that we tend to assume. I think we tend to assume, for the obvious reason that we live in capitalist societies, that wealth can automatically be translated into power. But there's no anthropological or particular reason 
There's no scientific reason to assume that this is a culturally universal attitude to wealth. Actually, we have cases that we discuss in the book, uh, like the indigenous societies of the Eastern Woodlands of North America, where clearly there was no obvious way to translate material wealth into social influence or power, uh, even landed uh, wealth. You know, these were not strictly egalitarian societies. You had wealth differentials, but it didn't mean that you could instantly translate those into the ability to tell people what to do or extract their labor. So I think there is a kind of level of conceptual difficulty about the accumulation of wealth, which is sometimes skipped over in archeological uh, analysis. It's not that the wealth accumulation isn't important. Actually, my main research project at the moment is on one of those uh, early Bronze Age cemeteries up in the highlands of Turkey at a site called uh, Başohuyuk. Uh, near the town of Sirt, where you have incredible concentrations of metallic wealth in graves at a time when there is no evidence for states or even chiefdoms in that region. And these are the burials of teenagers. They're all aged between about 12 and 16. And you see the concentration of these incredible amounts of lost wax cast, metal work and, and, and uh, metal weaponry, uh, in a ritual context that has no obvious counterpart outside of that context in the world of everyday settlement remains or, or regional uh, you know, trade systems or interaction. So what's going on there? I mean, clearly it would be much too simplistic to just say, well, these are royal tombs. Uh, we need you know, another level or maybe multiple levels of analysis. Yeah, very clear. Thank you. That can be a point to, to think about the future also. Mm. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I'll throw in a question. Sure. Um, um, I'm, uh, I always, I've always thought of, uh, well, Egyptian kin kinship in particular, but not only that. You, you spoke of sovereignty. Uh, the king being able to to kill almost on a whim, want, wantonly, and uh, to um, sort of take whatever he wants, to, to wield a, a form of power uh, that is, is apparently absolute. It's a display of, of power. To me, I'm, I'm, and to my mind, uh, that, uh, that king is potentially a, 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 pup, a puppet who is harnessed by forces behind him, people who are uh, actually running things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I see that in Egypt mm -hmm. in, many, in many periods. But I, I, also, I also know that this, this kind of relationship between the king and, and I'll use a word that you haven't used, elite, um, is um, kind of a, a very important factor in the dynamics of, of mm -hmm. power and sovereignty. And there's a... a, a a fine discussion of this uh, uh, in, in uh, a book you you cite in in your in your book, which is uh, uh, Claude Meillassou's uh, mm. Anthropo Anthropologie de l'esclavage, the, yeah, yeah. the, the, anthrop the, womb, the womb of iron and gold. In exactly, English, in exactly, title. exactly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the the anthropology of slavery by by the, by Claude Meillassou, and where he describes exactly mm -hmm. this this kind of thing. Any, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, it's actually uh, like a level of detail and, 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 and nuance that would require another book in itself, but it's certainly the case, you're right. I mean, what we're talking about here are kind of, I guess, the idealized institutional forms of power rather than the nitty-gritty of how courts actually functioned. I mean, I think it would work in the Maya case, probably all these cases, for example, where you have an ostensibly patriarchal household. Actually, it's the senior females who are calling the shots a lot of the time and determining who's in and who's out. Um, it's a level of detail that in, in, in the book we didn't, couldn't really go into without sort of getting into a whole other area, but um, certainly wouldn't dispute uh, at all what you're saying. So what we're trying to do rather is define the kind of official or sanctioned idea of power, the kind of sign of power under which all of this goes on. Right, thank you. <laughs>
Are, we, are there any other questions? Altre domande? I'll, um, if there aren't any more questions, then uh, I would like to thank Pr uh, Professor Wengro again so much for this. Uh, you, uh, we've really seen a, a lecture that has ventured in, in terrains that are very important to, to e our understanding of ancient Egypt, even when we weren't talking about ancient Egypt at all. So um, I um, th thank you very much for a, for, a for a wonderful talk, David. Thank you.